The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Day by day and with each passing moment Strength I find to meet my trials here Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear. The sermon this morning comes from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 31st and the 32nd verse. I preached this one other time at the Forest Hill congregation just a few weeks ago, and there were a large number of responses, and I wasn't aware about the problem that exists in the human heart in the church concerning this subject. Paul said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I call this sermon that we had better bid bitter. Bye-bye. But the word bitter here needs some explanation. This letter we call Ephesians was written about A.D. 62, and it was written from a Roman prison. And it was written, according to chapter 1, verse 1, to faithful saints. And yet, he is admonishing these faithful saints saints or set apart ones to put this away from them. That's interesting to me that regardless of their degree of consecration, he called them saints. Regardless of the perfection of their characters, they're still saints. Now that's a little bit different from the way some use the term saint, isn't it? They think it means holy or without sin but these people were active, faithful, but they needed to put some things away that they were storing up in their hearts. The purpose of this epistle, according to Ephesians 1.4, was to teach them that God had chosen them in Christ before the foundation of the world that they should be holy. That's God's predestined plan, that in Christ everyone who is there should be holy and without blame before Him in love. The problem is, if I have some of these things in my heart, especially bitterness, then it's difficult to be holy and without blame before Him in love. This is why I need to put it away, this bitterness. The word from which bitterness is translated came from a root word, P-I-K, of all things. To cut, to prick something, to use a pointed, uh, sharp instrument. And it's the case that it's translated different ways in the New Testament. If you'll run over to James 3, 11 for a minute, you'll find James writing, Can a fountain put forth both sweet and bitter water? But then a few verses later, verse 14, he says, We don't need to have bitter envying. So he uses it a little differently in both of those verses. But here in our verse, we should translate it, don't hold a grudge. Don't be hateful. This is the thing that Peter saw in Simon after Simon sinned. He said, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness. Was Simon angry at someone? Probably not. But, Paul, but Peter called his state of mind as, ha, as being poisonous. It was keeping him from doing what God wanted him to do. In our churches today, our members react this way sometimes to every problem. I remember when my teenagers were told no, they normally rebelled somehow. And that is the fact with too many of us in the church. When we're told no, we rebel. 
There's an old joke that goes around among preachers that when you preach on giving, the giving goes down. Well, what is that bitterness? So this morning, for just a few minutes, let's talk about what it is and its companions and also when we get to the end, its remedy. But I want to ask the question also, who participates in this thing? First of all, let's define it. Bitterness is grudgeitis. It's the best way I can define it. And we have so many admonitions not to be that way. Saul, the psalmist, I believe David, wrote, Fret not thyself because of the evildoers. Why are you bitter about that? Psalm 37, 1. And in, the ver in verse 34, as he ends that psalm, he says, Wait on the Lord and keep His way. Why are we fretting? If we have any kind of a feeling like that in our hearts, it's controlling us. I read about a grizzly bear who lumbered into this clearing where there was a garbage dump and he started feeding. And the watching tourists noticed that he would drive away other grizzly bears, but there was one animal that joined him in the garbage dump and the grizzly bear didn't bother it at all. He just let him eat right alongside of him and that was a skunk. Now, I think he resented the skunk's presence and he could have easily won a fight with him, but he didn't. Why? Because that grizzly knew the high cost of getting even. That's a smart grizzly. And some of us don't know the high cost of getting even. The great physician said when he sins and he repents, forgive him, 70 times 7. And folks, that's a good prescription for my soul and for my body. The moment I start hating a man, I become his slave. He starts controlling my emotions. I can't escape his tyrannical control of my mind. He hounds me wherever I go. He may be miles away, but he whips my thoughts into such frenzied madness that even when I go to bed, it's a torture rack. Why? Because the bitterness is still there. And it can become a lifelong problem. Since we've defined it, I want you to read with me some of the companions of bitterness. If you'll open your New Testament to Romans 3 for a moment, In Romans 1, Paul describes the state of the Gentile world before the cross. Terrible situation. It didn't produce justification. In chapter 2 of Romans, he describes the state of the Jewish world before the cross. And it certainly did not produce justification. And then in chapter 3, he starts quoting from the Old Testament Scriptures to prove his point that justification did not occur under the patriarchal and or mosaic system. In fact, he says there's just one law of God, and he's setting out to prove that every man was guilty under it. But in the course of doing that, as he quotes from the Old Testament, he lists a number of companions of bitterness. If you'll read from verse 9 there with me, What then are we Jews better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, chapter 1, both Jews and Gentiles, chapter 2, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Under the Old Testament system, there was no legal justification. Men were not forgiven of their sins in the legal sense yet. That had to be accomplished by the blood of Christ on the cross at Calvary, Hebrews 9 and 14 and 15. He says, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable, none that doeth good, no, not one. Throats an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass was under their lips, watch this, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Do you know what leads people to abort a baby? Look at the next verse. Their feet are swift to shed blood. They have this problem in their hearts. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known? There is no fear of God before their eyes. The minute 
I get upset with another human being, if I let that thing fester, if I don't remedy it, I've gotten into a situation where all of those things he lists there are my companions. Well, with Simon, this apostate, he called him bitter. He said, you're in the gall of bitterness. That's one of the companions, gall. If you'll look at James 2 for a moment, you'll find out that James talked about those who erred from the truth. I love that word erred there. It's P-L-A-N-E-T-H-O in the English, planetho. It means to wander. Here, wandering off from the truth. We get our English word planet from it. Why? Because the Greeks thought the planets wandered around out here. They had no idea there was gravitational pull on them. And so we, get, we just took the word planetho, which literally means to wander, and called our bodies out here planets. But this man erred from the truth. Why? He's bitter. He's got this sense in him. We interviewed 27 people at one place where I was a local preacher to find out why they left the church. And in every case but one, we sensed this feeling that I've got something against somebody and the feeling overwhelmed them. Look at Hebrews 12, 15. Some of the companions of bitterness are spiritual failures. He says, you look diligently lest any man fall or fail of the grace of God lest any act of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Think about it. That little word bitterness, but many fall because of that. One of the companions of bitterness is apostasy. People trouble me, and I let it work on me, I end up being defiled. But that feeling, if it gets worse, can lead me away from God. I talk to a lot of divorced people. This is a problem. They have that bitterness, and it's dragging them backwards. Who is a participant in this sin? Brother Moser, I just can't cope with these situations in life. I'm overwhelmed. I don't like it. I think maybe Job's friends, Brother Case, were like this. But look at Philippians 4.13 and think about it. Where is Paul when he writes this? Roman prison. And yet he says, I can do all things. And the text says, I can keep on doing all things through Christ who keeps on cleansing me. And there in verse 11, I think it is, he says, in whatever state I am, I'm content. That's important to me because I'm a Yankee and I'm down south. So in whatever state I am, I have to be content. I know that's hard, brothers and sisters. In 71 years of living, I've learned that there are some hard things in life. In fact, I don't like being 71, to tell you the truth. It's hard for me to walk now. It's even hard for me to think. But I tell you what, I'm going to cope with it if Christ will help me. I'm not going to let it stop me. People who claim that they just can't cope are in this situation. In, in the second place, sometimes when a person is chastened, he gets this feeling. Look at Proverbs 29.1. Solomon was told by inspiration's uh, mind to write this. He said, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Have you ever had someone try to correct you? What did you do? Did you harden your neck? 
Let's see, Riley, you were in school. Did we ever have to correct anybody in the class? What did they do? Some of them hardened their necks, didn't they? They didn't like the chastening. I'll run over to uh, Hebrews 12, 5, however. Because the Hebrews writer said, don't hate the chastening of the Lord. Don't faint when you're rebuked of God. I need this correction. I don't know that I like it, but I've learned one thing. Don't harden my neck. Take it and work on it and see if it's okay later on. I don't know. Who likes to be chastened? Nobody. Children especially don't like it. I've heard children say to mom and dad, I hate you. Well, we need to work on that feeling with them. Because we don't want it to be a lifetime habit. People who fail in the third place are participants in this particular problem. One of the biggest failures in the Old Testament was Jezebel. You talk about a bitter lady, and she passed that bitterness on to her husband, Ahab, and they ended up murdering a guy. Her bitterness was so great that God allowed her to be destroyed. What a lady. But there's one that you hadn't thought about, maybe. Look at Revelation 21.8. The fearful partake in this sin. The fear of man is a snare, Solomon said. And there's only one being that I should fear. And that's God. In the sense of awe, I will not participate in fear of man. In fact, who participates in this problem? Everybody. Everybody's had this problem over the years. The envious have a problem here. The jealous have a problem here. The misunderstood have a problem here. You ever been an elder in the church of Christ? Did you ever feel like you were misunderstood? Those folks don't understand what I'm doing. That comes that bitterness. Even by their own wives, they're not understood sometimes. So we pray for them to overcome this. Preachers feel this way a lot. I'm just misunderstood. Why do people treat me this way? How many of you work? If you hold a job, somewhere along the line, you got upset with your boss. And this feeling started. Maybe it would stay with you. Did you bring it home to your mate? You know how my boss treated me? I'd go home and tell Dorothy, that Curtis Cates is so mean to me. <coughs> After all, he was my boss for 25 years. No, he wasn't really. I really didn't have that complaint, Brother Cates. Thank you very much. But it could happen on the job even that you could have this feeling. How many of you parents have children? Well, if you're parents, you have children, right? You felt this feeling even when you were trying to discipline them. And what about your mates? How many times do I have to deal with these students and their wives and the difficulties they're having because this feeling built up and they couldn't get rid of it? And we deal with people who say, well, I'm too poor, or I'm too rich, or uh, uh, I'm, just, I'm just not prejudiced, but I don't like that person, or did you see what that person did? And they start this fault finding. You know, that's easy to do, incidentally, fault finding. Everybody has them. Hypocrites, the unthankful, the unholy, all think they're misunderstood. Well, I meant that in a good way, someone will say after he's run down someone. And I'll tell you something else. I've seen this when we challenge the belief of someone. Bitterness springs up. They immediately begin to fight. One, and I don't know how to explain this one really well, but oftentimes when I lose my mate, I get angry at him when he goes. I've seen that phenomenon. It's not, it's not evil. It's just the way we are as human beings. But it makes us uncomfortable, and then this bitterness springs up. And oftentimes, Riley, when we talk to someone about his sins, 
we notice the bitterness. If you're feeling anger because you've lost a loved one, it's normal. And it will fade away. But it can cause this bitter feeling and make you uncomfortable. People who are overlooked feel this thing. People who are overworked feel this. People who are offended or overly critical feel this situation. There are a lot of participants in this problem. I want us to look at James 3.13 a moment. And I want to suggest the remedy for this difficulty. James asks a question here that is very important. He said, Who is a wise man, endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, a good life, his works with meekness and wisdom. But watch now. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. I first must recognize that this is my problem. That's wisdom. I admit the problem first. That's wise. That begins the healing process and getting rid of it. Jesus said that we must recognize that if we're going to be Christians, people will attack us. They attack the prophets before us. Matthew 5, 13. So I need to recognize the problem. Bitterness has no glory. It cannot do anything but lie against the truth. And brothers and sisters, it discourages us and congregations. It's contagious. It will spread quickly among people. You can round up a lot of people and tell them all these bad things and they'll start with you and, you, and then the problem starts. But this kind of thing is inconsistent. You can't have bitter and sweet water out of the same fountain. And it tears us apart psychologically. So the remedy is recognize what's going on. And number two, confess it. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How do I detect it? Let the Word of God do that for you. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And watch now. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Bitterness is a, re, is a learned habit. But if we don't squelch it, it is a very bad consequence. Moses, how come you didn't go into the promised land? The people were complaining. When you read about the Israelites in the wilderness, about every other chapter, they're complaining and griping and bitter. And on this particular occasion, they needed water. And God said, Moses, speak to the rock, and I'll give you the water. Huh. Moses got so bitter toward the Israelites, so angry, Numbers chapter 20, that he hit the rock twice. The rock in Horeb, the type of Christ. Moses, you just violated the type. You don't crucify the Christ twice. He was only supposed to speak to the rock anyway, wasn't he? What caused him to do that? Bitterness. In fact, he, he wrote later that God punished him because of the people. He wasn't even ready yet to admit his sin. Bitterness is a learned habit. And like Moses, we may miss the promised land if we don't take the remedy. 
Whatsoever things are true, you want to get rid of bitterness? Whatsoever things are honest, you want to get rid of bitterness? Whatsoever things are just, pure, lovely, and of good report. Someone called me on the phone the other day and wanted to tell me about a brother, and I said, no, I don't want to hear it. It's not a good report. I don't want to hear it. I don't have time to think on bad reports. Besides, I don't believe that brother did whatever you were going to say. The brother that was on the other phone got bitter and hung up. I don't want to hear that bad report. If I want to get bitter, I just listen to the evening news. Because everything there is the world reporting on itself, and the whole world, John says, lies in wickedness. And then he ends that sentence in Philippians 4, 8, with if there be any virtue, if there be any praise. Think on these things. You want some good psychological advi advice this morning? Think the thoughts that Paul tells us about in that verse. God instructed us to get rid of bitterness. What's the blessing of overcoming? Look at Revelation 2, 7. Brother Cates, I know where that tree of life is. That one you can't reach right now. It's in the midst of the garden of God. Revelation 2, 7. So if I overcome today this problem, if I don't let it eat at me, I'm going to be exempted from the second death. Hell, Revelation 2, 11. I'm going to eat of the hidden manna, Revelation 2, 12. I'm going to be clothed in white, Revelation 3, 5, and sit right on the same seat that my Lord is, Revelation 3, 21. When a person is so grateful for the gospel of Christ and the blood of Christ, there's no possibility to be bitter. Because no matter what happens in life, I'm going to go to him eventually. Because everything works together for good to those that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 5048, Duluth, Georgia, 30096, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Truth for the World is a work of the Duluth Church of Christ in cooperation with churches of Christ throughout the world. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear.